Okay, the good news is we have been recommended for an award for a grant. The bad news is this is really eating into my classroom instruction time, <laughs> having to deal with these little uh, dumaflaches associated with that. So without further ado, let's plunge boldly into this, uh, doing the 6S event. All right, so 6S uses the old motto uh, that our grandparents used to say, a place for everything and everything in its place. An illustration that we often like to use is a fire truck. On a fire truck, everything has to always be in a consistent place because lives are at stake when you're responding to a fire. So, our six S's are safety. We're going to fix unsafe conditions when we discover them. We're going to sort, separate what's needed from what's not needed. We are going to straighten, organize what is needed. We're going to sweep, clean, and make it visual. We're going to standardize who does what, when do they do it. And we're then going to sustain. We're going to keep it up and improve over time. All right, uh, some of these you have seen before, but I'm never hesitant to reinforce. Uh, so, when we talk about waste as MUDA, uh, there are actually three types of waste. Uh, uh, MUDA, MURI, and MURA. Uh, MURI and MURA are taken uh, care of with Jidoku and, um, and production leveling. MUDA covers uh, wider categories of waste. So the first is defects. Don't pass on a problem to a customer. Whether that customer is the ultimate customer or the person who is uh, next to you, whose workstation you pass it to. We don't want overproduction because more inventory means we've spent more money without necessarily being able to make a profit off that. We want to eliminate waiting. We do that with one piece flow, not the old mass production paradigm of batch and queue. We want to eliminate any kind of non-value processing. So we don't want we rework. We don't want to add frills that only we care about, the customers do not care about. Transportation, we always want to move things with the least amount of effort. And that effort includes machine effort. A lot of factories have AGVs or automatically guided vehicles. But, very often when they have those, all that happens is our parts are getting a tour of the factory. They're not actually doing anything worthwhile. We want to eliminate uh, injury because that costs money, that costs time, that costs effort. Motion we always want to produce with the least amount of movement. And energy is all kinds of energy. Electrical energy, human energy, pneumatic energy, hydraulic energy. We want to make sure that we are preserving our resources 
and we're eliminating disconnects uh, between processes and between what we have to do. Remember, waste always comes disguised as honest work that has to be done, right? Always examine work very carefully. Does this work have to be done? All right, so let's dip into those uh, a little bit more. With uh, safety, we do want to fix unsafe conditions as discovered. Very often what you find uh, in industry or the home or the office is an unsafe situation where people are now used to uh, uh, just going around that area or uh, in some other way compensating for the unsafe situation. Bloody hell, let's get rid of the unsafe situation. So we want to be sure that we're discussing safety with the workers. And so that could mean uh, stand-up safety meetings in the morning. Uh, that could be mean reviewing incidents that happened uh, that either caused uh, a, a problem or potentially could have caused a problem. Damaged equipment, let's repair it or uh, uh, oh, bloody hell. Let's repair it or let's um, uh, replace it. Trying to work with damaged equipment just slows everything down and it can be a, a safety hazard. Let's look for trip hazards. Uh, we always want to eliminate anything that could cause someone to trip. Uh, lifting from unsafe heights. Uh, OSHA guidelines tell us that there should be no shelves over five feet uh, in an ordinary circumstance. Um, but lifting from an unsafe height could also include picking something up from the floor that's very heavy or from a lower shelf. Ergonomic issues, we want to be sure that we're dealing with those. And electrical issues, uh, we always want to make sure that we don't have uh, open electrical connection boxes, uh, wires sticking out that are live, things of this nature. Um, right? We want to be sure also to have appropriate uh, signage such as we have here, oops, uh, uh, this is from a uh, uh, company that I consulted with, which uh, since then uh, has uh, gone under uh, because they were too successful. I hate when that happens. All right, so let's talk about simple ergonomics. In ergonomics, you're strongest in your strike zone, uh, or sometimes we call it the power zone. That's from your shoulders down to your knees. That's where you're going to have the greatest strength. And the closer the, that, uh, when you have more heavier things, the closer they are to your natural knuckle height, the better off you're going to be. We also want to minimize reaching and minimize twisting. All right, so then we talk about sort. We want to separate what's needed from what's not needed. So we remove everything from its place. We red tag everything that is not going to be needed, right? We're either going to recycle it. Recycling could be we actually recycle, uh, sending paper, uh, uh, paper uh, to a recyclers 
taking old pieces of metal and uh, selling them at a junkyard, or we're just going to throw it away depending on what it is. Recycling could also mean we actually take a piece of equipment or tools or whatever and we move them to a different shop where they would be more useful. So anything that's not needed anymore, uh, we're going to uh, recycle or toss. When in doubt, toss it out. Uh, we may make some mistakes um, uh, in this area, so we usually keep, or, or I've done it this way, I keep the red tag area going for the first week after the 6S, and if something is discur discovered to actually be needed, then we, uh, we take that back into the production area. Um, then after that first week, after the 6S event, we take the red tag stuff and do our recycling or tossing. We keep everything that's needed daily or weekly for work. Um, and I guess the possibility exists that we would have things that we needed monthly. Um, but again, be very wary of, uh, of just keeping things, oh, we might need this someday. Uh, well, bloody hell, we either need it or we don't. We want to fix the tools or equipment that's needed that's damaged or broken. Now, fixing that may also include just buying a new one. It is amazing how often management has fought me on replacing some pieces of equipment uh, that would be very cheap. The total for a whole new set of equipment would be a couple of hundred dollars or a couple of thousand dollars and would improve the efficiency. But they just don't want to spend the money, which is why we should do an engineering economy analysis of how much uh, money they could save. All right, our next S is straighten. We want to organize what's needed. The things we use the most, we want to be the closest to us. We want to use the first in, first out rule in almost every circumstance. There are some places where a different rule might need to be used. Uh, but usually that's at the production planning level. Uh, arrange everything to avoid confusion. Uh, right? We want the same thing always in the same place so that the workers can automatically be reaching for it without having to look. And we want to label those locations. When we start somebody new, we want them to know where to put the things that, they're, uh, uh, that they need after they pick them up. All right, sweep. Uh, first of all, that means uh, we want a thorough cleaning of the area. Um, and I mean, to the point where we scrub the grease off the machines, we scrub the uh, grease and oil off the floor. Uh, maybe we even strip the paint off the floor and repaint the floors. Um, when, if we paint the floors, though, the standard in the aircraft industry is to paint floors oyster white so that when you drop something, it shows up. And that is not a bad idea for any industrial production. All right, so the other part of sweep besides clean is to be able to sweep with your eyes to see what is, uh, what is going on, um, uh, either where your parts and, and materials are or for the manager to be able to sweep 
uh, with their eyes and see what's happening in their shop. Okay, so we want to mark locations for our equipment and tools. We want to mark hazards. We want to have clear instructions as to what to do, right? So a lot of times that is involved in making uh, checklists or folders that show the correct operations uh, and have the standard work there. We want to label any cabinet or any closed space as to what's in there. A lot of workbenches have drawers. Well, put a big old label on there that says what's in that drawer. A big label! <laughs> I have seen people, uh, they actually will type in like an 11 point font what's in somewhere so that you can't read it from more than uh, two feet away, or at least I can't. Um, all right, we're going to stab, uh, uh, standardize. We want to establish what goes uh, where, why it goes there. We want to keep ergonomics in line, uh, in mind, excuse me, uh, at all times. We establish who is going to do what, when are they going to do it, and make sure that everyone understands why they're going to do it. We want a schedule and an area check sheet so that cleaning the common areas, maybe that's a rotating job, uh, maybe that is something that is put on the water striders, but we have to know who is going to do what and when, when they're going to do it. All right. And our sixth S is sustain. We want to keep our 6S up. We don't want to do 6S and then we come back a week later or a couple of days later and the whole place is a mess again. What that means is we've got to do another 6S event. And 6S is the foundation for all lean. Uh, in fact, often consultants will just say, look, we've got to keep coming back and doing 6S for two years before they'll even start on some of the more abstruse portions of lean. We want to audit our 6S so that we know, are we making gains? Are we losing ground? Right? So we want high standards and checklists for keeping up our area. A clean, organized workspace is efficient. Uh, I have, well, for many years I worked in uh, technical theater. And I would often work with people who would say, oh, I can't be neat, I am an artist. Okay, no kind of efficiency, no kind of art, uh, artistry requires messiness. Again, if our space becomes disorganized again, we're going to just go back and do another 6S event, right? Now, we may have done 6S on a whole shop and we discover there are just two or three places that keep getting messed up. In that case, we go back to those places and just do uh, 6S on each of them. All right, so our benefits from 6S, first of all, organization is the first step to being more productive. It helps us maintain quality in our production. It gives us control over our process. It helps ensure safety. And what if we have a shop where customers or tour groups are allowed to come in and go through? In that case, 
they will see our quality and our professionalism. All right, visual management is an extremely important part of 6S. Our visual management can give us benefits like it helps our employees know what they need to do next, right? So a schedule works better than just having the boss come around and say, all right, do this, do that, do the other thing, right? Because once you start on the first one, you're likely to forget the others. So it aids our focus on improvement. Variation is always the enemy of the industrial engineer uh, or the lean specialist. So it exposes abnormalities that we need to look at and think about how do we fix. We can see what progress is being made in the work uh, by having good visual management in place. We can see what resources are needed if we have a spot that is marked this material is supposed to go here. If it's empty, we know we have a problem, <coughs> uh, et cetera. And it helps us increase the ownership of the jobs that people are doing. All right, so uh, essentially we usually think in terms of four types of visual management. First is uh, the display, right? This can be done with production control boards um, uh, or uh, just the ability to see what is going on, right? So you'll notice here our illustration is, oops, our illustration is a scoreboard. We don't, uh, uh, we don't wait for the end of the game to put the numbers up on the scoreboard, right? As soon as somebody scores a touchdown or somebody scores a field goal, that number is added into the current score. Uh, the next type of visual management is the and-on or signal that attention is needed, right? We illustrate that with the traffic light. Although usually in production, when we use an and on, it is either a signal that uh, the process is going well, we usually signal that with green. We may be having a problem, would be yellow, and we're stopping production, that would be red. Now, sometimes the people get ridiculously carried away with and on, and they'll have like five or seven lights stacked up that are supposed to tell you different conditions that are going on. Uh, I would say always we want to keep this uh, simple. All right, our third kind is controls, where we are... Uh, setting the behavior limits of the people, right? So uh, my illustration here is uh, caution welding area. I should have used a uh, 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 hard hat area. That would be more illustrative of setting a behavior limit. And our mistake proofing is our fourth type, and that sets limits uh, so that we either know when a mistake has been made or we have made it impossible to make a mistake. Uh, all right, so in our visual management, 
We might have safety instructions such as down here, again from Orion Drilling. Operating instructions. Uh, we have an illustration here also from uh, Orion Drilling where they had um, they had put instructions for the different types of welding uh, and joining that they had to do. Um, we uh, might have uh, be worried about the location of items. Uh, in this case, we have sorting of laundry, um, which I started doing uh, a long time ago uh, after I had gone over to visit some friends and I noticed that one of them was there. There was a gigantic pile of laundry uh, that he was sorting slowly piece by piece. And I'm like, why do we want to touch the laundry twice? Right? When I take laundry, uh, when I take my clothes off that are going to go in the laundry, why not put them in the proper uh, bin immediately? Or I take the linens off the bed or the towels out of the bathroom, whatever. All right, so one aspect of visual management can be the production control board. A, con a production control board uh, gives us the ability to look and immediately know what the status of production is. So over here we have a piece by piece uh, production. The daily goal is 48 uh, uh, widgets. We have done 30 already. And we note what problems are going on, right? These problems should be recorded in a production control board uh, type of folder or book so that those can be examined, right? Does this only happen one day because we have a poorly trained operator? Or is this a continuing problem? If it's a continuing problem, that might be the basis for a lean event. This other illustrates a process that takes all day where we have a mechanic A, a mechanic B, and an electrician. Uh, we have cards, all of which describe part of the task. And if the red side is out, they haven't been done. If the blue side is out, they have been done, right? So we can see, all right, mechanic A has completed his first three hours of tasks. Um, the electrician has actually completed the first four hours of tasks, but then all of these tasks still need to be done. Right? Again, we have a problem area. In this case, it says connections are not clean in electrical subassembly. All right. Again, if that's a continuing problem, we want to make that a uh, we want to make that its own lean event. All right. So often we do standard work instructions. And that can be as simple as uh, some instructions on the actual machine about where and um, where things are, what to do to make the machine work properly. Or that could be a whole list of things that need to be done, uh, kind of a checklist style. Uh, another thing that we might have is, um, this is an illustration from some consulting that I did where 
we were actually putting together binders of how to set up to do different processes on a CNC machine. Uh, so step five, set up fixture and machine and indicate the x-axis to make sure that the fixture is parallel to the machine table. Okay, so here is our x-axis that has to be checked. Here is the uh, uh, dial type uh, uh, feeler gauge. And then our step six still uses the same material, but we want to indicate the center of the fixture, right? Trace the center hole with our feeler gauge and so that we have a Y with a zero off offset. Okay, so uh, we were going through and putting together a binder where we go step by step through what had to be done to uh, set up that um, uh, set up that process. Uh, all right. So for visual management, kitting is one of our important ideas. The more complicated a process is, the more we want to have it properly kitted so that it can be done easily. All right, so our kits must contain everything needed for our task, right? Now, when I say everything needed, I mean all the parts that have to be done. For example, if you need a little tube of lube uh, to, do the, uh, uh, to do the process, well, that can be something that is at the workstation waiting. We want the kits to be arranged in a correct order. So we want to work from the right side of the kit towards the left side. And if we have to have a kit with multiple layers, we want the first items on the top layer, second items on the next layer, and on down. All right, point of use means that we want all the equipment, all the forms, the tools, anything that we need right where they're going to be used, right? A lot of times we use a shadow board because that will show us if an item is out of place. And we want the one-step rule. In other words, we want people to be moving a little bit. If they're, do, if they're standing up, we want them to be moving half a step here to do this, half a step there. It's very, very tiring to just stand in the same place all day long. Right? Uh, if we have people working in a standing situation where they're just working at a bench or something of that nature, anti-fatigue mats are very, very helpful. We can use a point of use assessment, a scoring tool. You'll notice here we have concentric circles. Uh, and our illustration is uh, an operating room. Now, the method that we see in, on TV and in the movies where the doctor uh, just sticks his hand out and says scalpel and they put the scalpel in his hand, that was actually invented by an industrial engineer, Frank Gilbreth. Uh, in the early 20th century invented that idea because he filmed <coughs> pardon me he filmed 
his um, uh, children getting tonsillectomies. And he noticed that when it was time to get a new tool, the doctor would just turn and kind of rummage around in the equipment until he found what he wanted. And Frank Gilbreth immediately realized that that was very wasteful, that the doctor was taking their eyes off the patient while the patient was uh, uh, unconscious. They, they might, it might be a very critical operation. So he invented that whole idea of having the nurse there who hands the doctor the instruments. All right, so in our point of use assessment scoring, we have the supervisor, information, tools, fixtures, materials and supplies, fasteners, and parts. Not all of these may uh, obtain when we are uh, doing uh, a point of use assessment. Uh, so we look at these different levels and we ask what is the maturity of each of these. Uh, so uh, if uh, we score it as a five, if it's an easy reach, if I can just reach over and grab it, uh, then we're going to give it a five. A four is within five steps, which I would have been tempted to make it fewer steps than that. Uh, three, it's in the immediate area. Two, it's in the shop somewhere. And one, it's outside the shop. Oh my God, stop this show. Right, so we're looking at, oh, well, I guess that's it for that. Uh, right, but we can do an assessment and we can create what we call a radar chart or a spider chart that shows the levels that each of those are at and we can compare over time to see how our point of use is improving. All right, so total productive maintenance, we've talked a bit about this before. Look, if we have somebody who operates the machine every day, they know when something is, is wrong. They should be the ones keeping the machines clean and operational, and they should be doing the routine maintenance. When we have our total productive maintenance or our total preventive maintenance, whatever uh, name we want to give this paradigm. We're going to increase the machine availability, the performance efficiency, and the overall equipment efficiency. We are trying to eliminate machine downtime, hidden lows, losses. We talked a little bit about that. If you can cast your minds back to the um, uh, to the class before uh, our midterm. And we want to get rid of process defects that are a result of uh, the machine not being in proper alignment or whatever. All right, so we have our machine operators cleaning the machine and the area daily. We want them to report problems as soon as they notice them. We want to make sure our parts are, or our supplies that are needed are immediately available. We want a log of maintenance and breakdowns. Uh, we want to keep the area clear for productive work. That's an ordinary part of our 6S. And clean as you go. Don't let the mess accumulate to the point uh, where it becomes a danger. All right, well, work measurement, um, 
actually, I love it when we can offer work measurement class uh, because that will um, uh, that will allow us to learn enough about work measurement to be expert, hopefully. Okay, but you don't have to be an expert to do at least rough work measurement because we need the real current data from the floor or the office or wherever we're looking. When we use work measurement, we can identify waste, process flaws, things that we look at the process and we say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Issues with layout of the shop or the workstation. We can see safety or ergonomic issues. And we can record data that we can use to compare later uh, to our uh, improved state. All right, so first of all, we want to start with rough times for processes. Uh, my, what I am familiar with doing is I'm going to study a certain process. I go and I talk to the operator and I say, all right, you are going to redo this assembly. Uh, uh, you're either going to take it apart and uh, repair it or you're going to assemble one or whatever. So then I say, what are, uh, what are the steps in the process? And one thing you should be aware of is even the operators, the experts, don't know all the steps that they go through uh, for these processes. Uh, so be uh, aware that what they give you is not going to be the exact process. It's going to be a rough approximation. All right. We particularly want to see any problematic area inside our method or our process. Right? So we're looking for variation. We're looking for equipment problems. We're looking for bad processes or where training is needed, right? Now, these aren't necessarily everything that can go wrong. And when we do this work measurement, the best way is videotape. Um, well, I say videotape, but usually video is recorded digitally now. Um, but when I started doing work measurement, we used to use videotape. Um, if we video, that means we can review over and over in case there's a part of it where we're going, what is that person doing there, right? We can go over it and over it, even take that to the person and say, what were you doing here? I really uh, uh, couldn't see. All right, so when we're looking at the process through a work measurement paradigm, we're looking to find problems. What are we always searching for, right? We're looking at what does the operator have to search around for? Is it a problem of visual management? Is it a problem of they're just putting things down randomly all the time? What do we have to be reminded to do? Is there part of the process that is not obvious? What is the information available to do the job? Um, we aren't looking for perfection, uh, particularly on our first pass. We're looking for a better system. Let's get the people who are going to use the system to create the system. So you as a lean person should be there facilitating the event, not trying to dictate what to do. 
Uh, so let the workers compete with their different improvement ideas, right? Because the synergy of everyone working together may mean that one guy says, well, I want to do it like this. And then another one says, okay, but if we also do this with that, it'll be even more efficient. Okay, keeping in mind, we want to use common sense as we're improving. So when we're going along, we want to make sure we're on the right track by asking these five questions. Will the cost be lower? Well, that's kind of important. Does this improve our quality? Will this improve delivery speed? Is it going to be safer? And is this going to make this a happier place? Not an obvious one, but when we do lean, when we help people improve, it should help to improve morale. Right? A lot of times, so-called efficiency experts come in and what they really do is they tell everyone they have to work harder and that's the secret. Well, who wants someone that's coming in and telling you you, want, you have to work harder? There are places where maybe people are slacking off a bit, but my experience is Usually it's the system letting down the workers rather than the workers are slacking off. Um, when I go in and I talk to people uh, during a lean event, I say, look, if your job isn't easier after, uh, after we're done here, then I haven't done my job correctly. Okay, so uh, thanks to this laundry list of people, my spiritual advisor, uh, my, uh, uh, my old partner, uh, Bo Creek, and uh, my friend Harlan Womble. Lisa Farr, well, she encouraged me to uh, get this put together, but not as big a part of the process. And I don't know why, we have an extra point of use slide, but we do. Okay, so that is 6S. If you have any questions about this presentation, uh, like I said, I'll put a PDF copy of the presentation uh, in Moodle, uh, along with the link to the two videos that we have ended up uh, with uh, as part of this. Um, and uh, you'll be able to download that PDF and follow along uh, uh, on it uh, as I go through the presentation. Thank you very much.